day. Yeah. And just another day of life worshiping God, another day with opportunities to serve Him and glorify Him in our lives is a wonderful thing that we should thank Him for. Have you ever heard that quote, what if we woke up tomorrow with only the things that we thank God for today? Yeah. Like, how many how many things would you still have left? Right. Ooh, that's so convicting. <laughs> that's like when Eddie prays. He's like, thank you for everything in the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> Just covering like, it's it all. Good. It's good, bud. That's good. You get it all in there. <laughs> Is thanks. Thank you for all the people in the whole world. <laughs> so how do we fight against that pride, though? You know, sitting here and just talking about, well, realize your dependence. But I have found a lot of help in seeing how Paul prays in his letters and kind of those, what are some of those practical things that can help us in our prayer life? Well, in James 4, he's warning against worldliness. And he says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. So we have to humble ourselves and draw near to the Lord. That's what he's saying. Mm -hmm. Humble ourselves and draw near to the Lord. I think when Jesus gave us the model prayer, he... He set us up for that by starting it off with our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So you're already put in a role of dependence by being the child of God. Mm -hmm. And then hallowed be your name. Like His name is so much greater and mightier. He is the all-powerful creator of all things who we are dependent on. That sets your heart in the right posture. Right. Because now you are humbling yourself. You're realizing mm -hmm. you are right. not sovereign over your own life. Yeah. He is. He's the Father. He's in control. And Jesus gets to petitions. He said, you know, give us this yeah. day our daily bread. Forgive us. Keep us from temptation. Yep. You know, keep keep us from sin. Help us to, you know, walk in a way that honors you, Lord. And you know what I mean? That all those things are there, mm -hmm. but it's not how it starts. Jesus taught us to start with rightly seeing ourselves before God. Well, and that's the difference between the pagan's prayer and then the Christian's prayer, too. Oh, my gosh. That's such a good passage. Yeah, so the, the Pharisee... And the tax collector go down to the temple to pray. And the Pharisee the whole time is thanking God. He's giving thanks. And he's giving thanks to God that he's not like the tax collector. He's giving thanks to God. That, God, I tithe. I do all the things right. Mm -hmm. I obey your law. I follow all your commands. Thank you for not letting me be like this tax collector over here. Mm -hmm. And the tax collector says, Father, have mercy on me, a sinner. And his head is bowed, and he's beating his chest, where the Pharisee's eyes were looking up to heaven. And Jesus says, who walked away from the temple justified that day? They answered the tax collector. Mm -hmm. How you approach God in your prayer is huge, and just how you see yourself before God is paramount. It all hinges on that. I struggled for a while with, with prayer, and I grew up in a Christian tradition where kind of prayer prayer was supposed to just come from your heart. You're just always supposed to make it up as you go, which probably is a bad thing. But we are given a lot of examples of prayer mm -hmm. in the Word. And one of the best ones that I, I was shown in Bible college was Paul in Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 9. He prays for the people of that church. And my teacher was saying, like, what better way to pray for those in your life who you care about, then praying scripture over them. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what a great idea. And this is what Paul says. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. So what did they pray? Asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And then Paul goes on to really get into some deep Christology in, in Colossians there, but that prayer is just so rich and wonderful, and I've used it as a a template to help me in my prayer life when I've struggled to, to know what to pray and to pray according to Scripture over the people in my life. That's my advice to anyone 
maybe struggling with what to say. I don't really have never prayed a whole lot before. I don't really know what to pray. What do I say? Obviously, Jesus gave us a wonderful example in the Lord's Prayer, a template to go off of. Mm -hmm. But here's a good example from the Apostle Paul in Scripture to... Well, and I think if you're going to God humbly, like you're not like going to God asking him to murder someone. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, that's where James talks about you pr- you ask, but you ask amiss. Right. <laughs> but God's just going to say no. And then right. he'll probably, you know, work something out in your heart, hopefully. But if you're going to God humbly, it's okay to ask something because if it's not in his will, he'll just say no. So mm-hmm. I, I don't think we should be afraid to go to God and say, hey, God, I really do need a new car. Like, legitimately, mine's about to die. So, if you yeah. can help me figure out a way that would be wise to get another vehicle, can, like, just yeah. sh- show me, you and know? James, James starts out with just asking God for wisdom, too. Right. So, I don't think we should ever be afraid. To, like, it's, we're not saying you should only, like, pray spiritual prayers. Like, only yeah. only pray for wisdom. Only pray for peace or patience. or Those are great things. No, it can be super practical. Yeah, but, like, if someone is sick, pray for them. And James yeah. even says that. Pray yeah. for them. Um, a lot from James. Go read James. <laughs> yeah, if you're struggling with prayer, go read James. <laughs> it's That's probably a really good suggestion. Practical help. Don't be afraid to pray for stuff. Because if it's not in God's will, he's just going to say no. Yeah. And that's our that's our position of trust in him, right? Yeah. We we give everything to him. And it and there's a way to talk to God about everything and and not be irreverent too. Mm-hmm. Cuz I think there's part of a movement too of just like, you know, God's just like, you know, Jesus is just like your buddy and you just talk to him like whatever and stuff and I think we should still be reverent. Right. In how we speak to God, right? Because even Jesus, who was deity, still hey, homeboy, Sup, what's up? Sub dad. What's up in the heavens? Sub padre. You know, he like he's what's still up in the heavens. <laughs> <laughs> Our father who art in heaven, mm-hmm. acknowledged, you know, his position, his right. standing, his authority over him. Mm-hmm. So we need to do the same when we approach God. But he still called him father. Mm-hmm. There's still it's still relational. So yeah, he is lofty and he's important and he's holy and he's clearly sovereign and creator much above what we are as creatures who is man that you are mindful of him yeah psalm 8 yep that's like the miracle of it right that's Mm -hmm. the miracle of prayer is who is man that you're mindful of him why is it that this god who is our father but also sovereign cares about us that's insane yeah that's what john said in first john 3 he said see what love god has for Mm -hmm. us in that we are children of god like it's crazy to think that we have this access to the creator of the heavens and earth. It is it is a privilege. It's Well, it's mind-boggling. If you really mm-hmm. sit down and you try and dwell on that for a minute, it will just mess your brain. Yeah, I know. A lot of what it is is we have to probably go to God in prayer first and acknowledge, listen, I'm having a hard time with this prayer thing. I know a lot of it's pride in my heart. And start off small. You know, if you're trying to develop a prayer life, don't uh, don't think you got to spend hours and hours to do it. Start off small. Just just do it. That's that's the biggest thing is just start praying. Yeah. And it will grow from there. And your relationship with God and communion with him will grow. Yeah. And, and pray about prayer. Pray. Yeah. Like, God. Yeah. Yeah, right. I don't, I'm really undisciplined in this. And I, I feel like this is something that doesn't come naturally to me. Give me the humility to come to you in prayer and see my need for prayer. I don't know if anyone's ever seen Pollyanna, but I love. There might be a couple. Yeah. I love old movies and literature and Lila's actually reading Pollyanna and she loves it. It's this little girl who actually ends up becoming paralyzed. But she starts this thing when she comes into this town as an orphan. She always talks about being glad. Find the things that make you glad. What What are the blessings in your life? If you start looking at what, what has God done for me? What are the things that he has that is yeah. doing? I mean, he's sustaining our life. What else is he doing? If you start looking and, and having like the glad mentality, like Pollyanna would say, I promise you, your mindset and your, the way you're viewing just God and his sovereignty and the way he is ordaining all things to work for good according to his purposes, like that's going to become more and more and more evident Mm -hmm. as you train your mind to even like start thinking that way and seeing these things that are going on around you. We're so focused on ourselves and our comfort and our preferences that oftentimes I don't think we even see the things that God is doing around us. We just see, we just feel and see the things we don't like. 
Yeah, right. Well, and here's a for instance. This might be a very poor analogy, but I'm just going to use it anyway. When I make our kids lunch, we have three kids. Mm-hmm. And for the most, car- most part, our kids are really not picky eaters. No. But every now and then, I will fix something for lunch, and one of the kids will be like, I don't want to eat this. I wanted X, Y, and Z. Sometimes I think that's our attitude. is like God will be doing something in our life that we don't deserve. Mm-hmm. You know, someone, he, he's doing something for us on our behalf. And instead of being like, wow, God, you did this awesome. You provided lunch for us again. That's so awesome. <laughs> yeah. We just complain because... Our waitress didn't get our food mm-hmm. quick enough. It really settles uh, con- discontentment. Discontentment. In our lives. It shows how good God is to you, how gracious He is, mm-hmm. how dependent on Him you are, and you start viewing God and His goodness that way. What a good, good father. I'm gonna smack you. You know, the more we talk about this, I feel how foolish I am for not praying more. And but knowing just... that we were gonna talk about this today, I was like totally convicted because when something goes awry in my life typically my first reaction is to like call a girlfriend and be like oh my gosh what am I gonna do or call you or my mom or something be like okay what should I do because I'm kind of freaking Mm -hmm. out right now or whatever and I'm like that's a terrible response because all of you are totally inadequate to really enact any kind of change first of all second of all why would I go to you when I can go to the creator of my you know entire existence who actually does have power to change Right. Or to bring about good in the situation. It's just so foolish, but... It's awesome. Now I'm convicted <laughs> because I didn't think about that earlier today. <laughs> All this conviction going on in one tiny little closet. It's incredible to me because God wants it to, you know? Mm-hmm. The the personal God of Christianity sets himself apart from most religions or belief systems. And it's such a wonderful thing. It's just incredible to think God wants... He wants to hear my prayers. Mm -hmm. Yes, he's sovereign and he knows it and we're not going to get into that. But he wants to hear it and he wants to give good gifts to his kids. Yeah, well, we can even have a whole conversation about whether you can go to God with your bitterness or anger or whatever. And there's probably a bunch of different camps on that. But there is... Well, part of prayer is confession of sin too. Yeah. And being honest with God about what you've been doing. Well, it's so stupid because God already knows if we're angry at him. Right. (laughs) So this is just kind of where I come from. Like, we've had some friends that have gone through some really hard things recently. And you will hear Christians that say, like, oh, you you can't be angry at God or you shouldn't be. And I know there's, like, a lot of really smart people who have degrees. I don't really understand why you would think you wouldn't go to God with that. It's not like you could really hide that from him anyway. So if you're feeling those feelings, go to him. Tell him, this is what I am feeling. Remove this. Help mm-hmm. me work through this. He, no, we're not saying you have a right to be. No, we're not. We're not saying but we're it's fallen right. Humans. But he knows it's there, so you might as well yeah. address the elephant in your in the room, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, that's totally a side. Well, I think you just take care of it anyway. And once again, I know there's people way smarter than me that would totally disagree with me and call me blasphemous probably, but... I think God would say, come to me still, right? Come to me, all you who are weary or heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Don't go anywhere else. Right. Don't wait until this anger or bitterness is gone and then come to me. That's never the approach that that God has set up. God has set up, come to me with all of it. Yeah. I will take it. Tim Keller, once again, has a really great sermon in which said that up until a few years back, he and his wife Kathy had a really hard time praying together. For some reason, it just, it was really something that never clicked in their marriage. They didn't have a problem praying together, but just staying consistent in it was really a struggle for them. Yeah. And he said that at one point, he and Kathy were sitting down talking about this. Like, why can't we just be more diligent in this? Why does it seem like there's just such a struggle? Kathy had used the example of, what if someone came to you and told you, you have a fatal disease, and if you do not take this pill that I'm going to give you, Every night at 11 p.m., you will die. Every night, you must take this pill at 11 p.m. in order to survive. What would our response be? Our response would be to set an alarm on our phone or, you know, remind each other, you better take that pill. Like, if you want to live, it would be at the forefront of your mind. If if your survival was at stake, you would make sure you took that pill every night. Without fail. You wouldn't You wouldn't chance it missing it either. You wouldn't. You would put up all kinds of protections around you to make sure you did not forget to take that pill. Yeah. Um, and he said that's what Kathy and I started to realize was that 
we were not viewing prayer rightly. We were not viewing it as our lifeline. Like this is what's keeping us in communion with the Holy God. We need this.